Welcome back, and a Merry Christmas from the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another episode. It wouldn't be December without us covering a Sabotage episode, so it's gutter ballet time here at the Metal Exchange. Merry Christmas, bud. How you doing? Merry Christmas. Six o'clock on a Christmas morning, this uh, <laughs> episode dropped, and what better album than uh, Gutter Ballet by Sabotage? Um, clearly, I didn't plan this as well as I could have in, in retrospect, but... Uh, you know, Still works. Uh, what a, Still close works. enough, I guess. So. Uh, just a little peek behind the curtain. We are obviously recording this in advance, so it is not actually Christmas. But uh, for those, or for most of you who are not members of our Patreon account, you are not getting this early. So it is Christmas morning for for the vast majority of you. But for those, and and there are a lot of new listeners out there. Welcome to the Metal Exchange, and definitely do consider joining the Patreon. It does absolutely help um, put this show together and you know we appreciate the support uh we're gonna skip in lieu of the fact that this one is 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 kind of going in the can a little early we're gonna skip the uh what you've been listening to segment and we'll probably skip the news at the end because it won't be so timely but that being said there is lots of sabotage to to discuss this is a band that we've obviously gone back to you know multiple times now on on the podcast and i i have to say um I would be shocked if we didn't cover all the albums at some point. But this is uh, this, much like the rest of them, Gutter Ballet going back to 1989, very much a transitional album for the band. It came out 24 years ago this month. It came out December 1st, 1989. Um, I can't believe it's that old. But when you go back to when we first heard the album, I mean, it had been obviously almost a decade, but now it's just kind of, an old old album it's it, well, i don't know where the time goes <laughs> uh you got me man 34 years it, uh, i believe it's been uh since this album was released thankfully um it's been a little bit less that we've been uh, enjoying this album but um not much. yeah I, not I, much in the grand scheme no yeah it uh, as as time goes on it'll become a smaller and smaller gap uh, uh in in comparison but um yeah this was one of the uh one of the big um albums for me like in my very early metal uh education um I, you know i'd mentioned at the end of the last episode um that this was i think the third metal disc that i ever uh purchased or or just owned um but sabotage was uh my first love in metal um and uh, it goes back to the mixtape that, that Ralph had made uh, where he um, so smartly put uh, a Zach era song and a John era song on that tape. And the, the Zach era song was a uh, chance from the handful of rain album. And the, um, the John era song was got our ballet from this album. So, um, you know, when it came time to buy my first metal CD, I, I I'll never forget it. Cause it, I was at the, the wall at um, Roosevelt field and where we would one day find the master of the rings, the oh, vaunted save, master it, of the save, rings it, double. save it, save it. Do not but, go yeah, into that. that. We'll talk about that because to... yeah, well the, our next Halloween episode will be the master of the rings. So we'll talk about that story at that time, which uh, it probably won't be terribly long from now. Uh, that said, um, that's where I was. And I literally was staying there with a handful of rain in one hand and got our ballet in the other. And, looking at the track list on the back as if it meant anything to me, which it didn't. It's just, I knew one song from each and I, uh, for whatever reason I went with handful of rain, but then um, the next time it was time to pick a sabotage album. It was an easier choice. And I, I grabbed this and uh, how far so those apart? Were my f- What's that? How far apart were the two albums? Was it like a week or two months? Uh, probably, or- I would say probably like months at most uh, at that point in time. I mean, I remember the summer of, 97 like all i was listening to was the tape ralph made and the handful of rain disc because that's pretty much all i had um if memory serves i believe i got triumph of steel by manowar as that was my second album i'm pretty sure i got that one from tower records on old country road um and then i'm pretty sure got our ballet was the third album i don't remember particularly where i got it or when um but it, it just i remember that very like 
early time of just having like this tiny little stack of of metal CDs. I already had lots of like other CDs, you know, your Pearl Jams and your Green Days and the Monkeys, obviously, but uh, didn't have any metal discs. Maybe I might have had Metallica, some Metallica discs that were given to me by my uh, cousin. He had given me um, the Black Album and Kill 'Em All, but actually, even I think. Um, he gave those to me because he knew I liked metal. So chances are I, I sabotage was definitely the first. Um, but this was back when I would buy a CD and just, I would listen to the shit out of it. Like I would just play it all, like, you know, especially when you only have three discs, <laughs> it's easy to go back to, but I, I listened to this album repeatedly. Um, I, there was a time where I, go, just uh, regarding handful of rain that I had to stop listening to handful of rain I listened to it so many times I could not, like, I was just, it was just, I couldn't listen to it anymore. Thankfully, I took a break, probably, like, years, like, I didn't listen to that album. And then I went back to it, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is still great. Um, well, that's but I just needed a break. the album, right? Like, you can listen to an album that much and still, still, after a while, go back to it and love it. And, I mean, obviously, that's kind of our mo on the podcast at least for for the episodes that we actually enjoy what we're listening to and that doesn't happen all the time most of the time but but not all the time but with something like this you know I, it makes me kind of long for those days where you really got to spend time with an album you got to look at the liner notes you got to kind of study the lyrics you would know who the band members are now it's almost like um music overload it's hard to keep up and it's uh you know you're lucky if you spend quality time with an album whatever that means for for you or for the you know for those that are listening but you know I, this was obviously or the early days of my fandom as well i had been listening you know i've, I've told this story many times but um after the alt rock thing of you know the early to mid 90s i had transitioned to metallica and tool and megadeth and then obviously this was uh you know the next logical step for me and obviously i was not hearing stradivarius at this point without that mixtape and I don't know that I would have discovered sabotage without the internet or, you know, without the internet and then without that tape. So this one is, is one that I've listened to repeatedly and, you know, having gone back, I, I still hold a soft space in my heart for it because. It Do you remember what your center. first sabotage album was? I don't, it might've been gutter ballet. I don't remember. Um, and I don't want to make it up. I, it was it was it was definitely before Wake of Magellan was like widely available. I don't think it was Dead Winter Dead though. I think it was this or possibly Handful because it was the only ones that I heard and I knew that I liked it. Um, it's also possible that it was Streets, but I just don't remember. Yeah, I to if I had to off the top of my head try and remember. Um... You know, it was definitely Handful of Rain first, then Gutter Ballet. I'm pretty sure Streets was the next one. I remember I got that for Christmas uh, later that year. Um, and then I believe after that, um, I think I, Edge, uh, Dead, Dead Winter Dead was next for me, then Edge of Thorns. I think then Wake of Magellan came out. And for us, Wake of Magellan didn't come out until early 98, even though it was released, I believe, in Europe and maybe Japan in 97. We, I remember we all, uh, Ralph didn't, but we, the rest of us waited until it was released in the U S and I remember buying that album, uh, particularly at Sam, Sam Goody at the, so at also Roosevelt when Field. That came out. and right. well, and who, and who sold it to me, but the, the sabotage super fan, Charlie, uh, he was so psyched to just to see somebody buying a sabotage album. And then at that point I would go back and start, uh, collecting the older albums i think all the mountain king came next and then i kind of went backwards from there um ralph sold me his copy of the dungeons are calling which uh i think we could technically consider an ep um and then i, I think it was Ry our friend ryan uh for uh, for my birthday one year uh bought me um I want to say it was either Sirens or Power of the Night. It was like the last Sabotage album I didn't have, and he was the one who uh, completed my collection. And then, um, and then I got Poets and Mad Men when it was released. But uh, that—that's kind of my 
recollection of my history of, of sabotage albums, but it was very much out of out of order. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, it's just kind of the timing and whatnot, and when you got into them and what was available at the time. It's funny that you could get an album like Power of the Night or Fight for the Rock, but you couldn't get their new album, Wake, at the time, which was really kind of ironic when you think about it, that they were still pressing the Atlantic releases, but the new stuff was, you know, importer or just wait and hope that it was going to come out domestically. Uh, You know, it's whenever I think of Sabotage, I always think about how so different the two eras really were. I obviously ending with streets and then kind of picking up with edge of thorns. Um, it's almost two different bands in a way. And I mean, each album has its own nuances and you can definitely hear the evolution, but this is uh, you know, this is John Oliva and his prime. And quite frankly, maybe the first TSO album. I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it begs the question, at least in certain spots, uh, certainly not through and through, but there are spots on this album where you can, definitely hear what would become Trans-Siberian Orchestra less than a decade later. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think there was a small bit of that on Hall of the Mountain King, particularly in that uh, instrumental track, Prelude to Madness, um, which TSO now plays regularly, that that kind of like intro to the Hall of the Mountain King song. Um which is tech, which is technically the classical song all oh, the mountain king um but this i feel like gutter ballet is where they really started to um delve into more of of that kind of uh more of an orchestral slash progressive slash uh i know that like you know we'll talk about john oliva's uh trip to see phantom of the opera was a, a big inspiration for a lot of, of what ended up on this album so it, it, it's definitely, I think, Sabotage's first album where the band kind of starts to lean into more of a theatrical direction where by the time we get to Dead Winter Dead and Wake of Magellan, they're like full-blown in pre... Well, I guess technically TSO would have been out by then, but I mean, it really was a very... Those two albums are very TSO-esque, um, where you know, looking back on it. Everything prior to Gutter was basically a straight up metal album. Uh, you know, he was obviously a big Beatles fan and there's certain influences there, but for the most part, it's just straight up, you know, hard rock, heavy metal, whatever you want to call it. But this is where I think you first start to see it. I, I prelude to madness. Good example, but I think you really start to hear it here, especially with the advent of the, or the, the inclusion of the, the piano sound and everything else. Um, you know, you I, gotta believe that, uh, no pun intended, but you gotta believe that, um, Paul O'Neill had a lot to do with this kind of change in style. Uh, He was brought on to start producing the band with Hall of the Mountain King. And so I think this is where his influence and like his teaming up with John Oliva really starts to kind of solidify, I think. I would agree with that. And I'll I'll also throw, at least for this album, Bob Kinkle, Robert Kinkle, who um, plays or gets credit for playing the keyboards on this, you know, still, still, active with John and obviously I believe, I don't know if he's still touring with TSO, but I know he used to, and he's obviously kind of the unofficial member of the band, kind of like the, uh, Jorn Ellerbrock of Halloween where he's back there playing the keys, but you don't hear him. That, but, that was a uh, deep cut, right? Yeah. There. <laughs> listen, I mean, when you got it, you got it. But, uh, yeah, this, you know, he, I think he's kind of an unsung hero and obviously gets credit for the keyboards on this album. Uh, you know, remiss not to kind of get into the lineup Many ways, and, and for many longtime fans, the classic Sabotage era, right? With John Oliva on, on lead vocals, pianos, keys, um, bass, and drums. But basically, the gutter ballet suite was all him. Chris Oliva on all the guitars, Johnny Lee Middleton on bass, and Steve Doc Wackholz on drums. Ironically, Chris Caffrey gets credit for being in the band, but doesn't record a note of this album. Um, from what I understand, it was the band's way of kind of introducing him to the world because he had, you know, was going to be a big piece of the band going forward. And, you know, obviously is still a big piece of sabotage to this day. Yeah, which is interesting because I don't know that Chris Caffrey, like, officially became a part of sabotage until uh, Dead Winter Dead, I think, was the first album that he actually participated 
on. I, I'm going to have to do a little bit of digging just to see if he was a touring member of the band. It doesn't really, maybe in 89, 90, they needed like a rhythm guitarist or something, but it looks like he um, would rejoin the band in 94 and then, and basically has been um, a, a a mainstay for anything sabotage or TSO related ever since. But uh, I always found it interesting when I was a kid and I'd have all the, the, ma- the, the manuals, I was going to say the, the liner notes. Um, and I'd be like, well, Chris Caffrey was on gutter ballet, but then he disappears for a while and then he's back on dead winter dead. And now that kind of makes a little bit of sense that it was kind of like, uh, he obviously had some sort of pre existing relationship with the rest of the band and, he would go on to do the Dr. Butcher album with uh, John when John was kind of trying, trying to kind of be more of a background player in Sabotage. Um, and I think that um, I think Chris's death or Chris Oliva, not, uh, not Chris Caffrey, Chris Oliva's death kind of changed John's trajectory with the band, but it seemed like with edge of thorns, John was kind of ready to kind of just, be more of a background player. And so I think Dr. Butcher was kind of his way of like, okay, I'll focus on this now and I'll do the vocals for this. And him and Chris Caffrey did that one together. But uh, I think, you know, after John basically (laughs) single-handedly did the entire handful of rain album, uh, you know, it was like a matter of, do we keep this thing going or not? And and then, you know, bringing on, Al Petrelli and bringing back Chris Caffrey and and bringing on Jeff Clayton, like really solidifying. That's the the second era of the classic sabotage lineup. I think there's those just those two all time classic lineups. I hold both in in pretty equally high regard. But uh, yeah, um, what was the point? I, I feel like I went off on a, on a tangent there. No, yeah, kind of you know, but, yeah, but, but ironically enough, um, and I, I learned this in in my prep. Back in 1990, after the album had been out for some time, Gutter Ballet was the, the video was getting you know some airplay on MTV, and not too surprising, Nirvana hadn't hit yet. But it's uh, it, it would be on Headbangers Ball, and and there was an interview where Ricky Backman took John Oliva and did an interview. And ironically enough, who else was in the interview? Chris Caffrey. And you say to yourself, this is a guy who wasn't even on the album. And and then ultimately would kind of you know come and go for a little bit or it was just unclear like but but, but to your point I think he was touring with them and, and playing um you know basically under under Chris Oliva who uh, certainly had no inability to play leads let's 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 call it for what it is truly an unsung hero in the guitar world and one of, and at least for my money one of the most easily discernible guitar players I've ever heard. When get Chris Oliva is playing guitar, you know it's Chris Oliva. I mean, th- nobody, and I mean no disrespect to Caffrey, but nobody plays guitar like Chris Oliva. Uh, no arguments here. Um, so, uh, I'm actually kind of uh, looking. I found some info about, you know, Caffrey actually did tour, uh, th- did do the Gutter Ballet tour despite not playing a note on the album, but quit at the end of the tour to form the band Witch Doctor with his brother Phil on drums, Hal Patino of King Diamond on bass, and future TSO West member Doug Kistner on uh, huh. keyboards. Uh, it says the band played all over America. However, the brothers were not clicking musically, and the band disbanded. Caffrey was contacted to perform on Sabotage's Streets tour, but uh, that didn't end up panning out. Um Caffrey learned thereafter that John Oliva had left Sabotage, and so he called John, uh, and John invited him to Florida, and over, quote-unquote, 10 bottles of Jack Daniels, the project Dr. Butcher was born. So just a little bit of a uh, little bit of background there is Chris, uh, Chris Caffrey's, um, you know, uh, connection to the band around that time. We have not really talked much about Dr. Butcher. That would be an interesting album to cover. Um not sure how many people out there are familiar with this Oliva Caffrey duet thing that they did, but the sabotage freaks that we were, I remember buying the Dr. Butcher album and I spent a fortune on that thing because you want to talk about a rare CD. That thing is hard to find. 
I don't think it was released in the U.S. initially. No. It eventually was, but at the time, I think we had to import it. And I remember, again, uh, Charlie from Sam Goody, uh, I remember him, uh, like, pushing for us to buy it. And he was like, he was like, uh, he just, I remember him calling it, it's a great breakup album. Uh, if you're ever, if you're angry about a breakup, it's a great album to listen to. And boy, I remember just listening to those first two tracks and thinking to myself, that he was right. It is, uh. Thanks, Charlie. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it's a very angsty, uh, album. I, I'll admit, I don't really know the album very well beyond those first two songs. Um, I never I, really I remember the first two it. songs quite, quite well, but. I, I thought we, that the. We should little, go back and listen to that. I think it would be interesting. I, I'm curious with the benefit of hindsight if I'd like it more than I used to. I mean, it had it had its moments, but I never thought it was, you know, it wasn't sabotaged. I'll tell you that it's it's a uh, a little bit more abrasive, but it's definitely interesting. I'll, I'll I'll say that. So I guess without further ado, with that backdrop, let's talk some gutter ballet, shall we? This album starts off with of rage and war and this as a kid was always a favorite of mine i thought it was just a perfect opening track i thought the helicopter that kind of swirls around when you're listening to it was just a really cool sound effect and the very and what i noticed right away you know by back then and even today very 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 bass heavy and um when you mix that with the chris oliva guitar sound it makes for just a beautiful pair this you know, I, I don't know when the last time I listened to Gutter Ballet was, or at least straight through, but you want to talk about oddly appropriate lyrics given where we are today? My God, this this song still resonates, and I couldn't believe going back. I'm like, you may as well have just written the song now. It would have it would have still fit. Literally the exact same thought came through my head when I was listening to this. And sadly, it's true. Uh it is still a very apt song. Um but uh yeah i it it's uh it's a very ag- aggressive song um i remember uh, we uh we're, we went we were going to splish splash which was a a water park on long island um and uh ralph's mom was driving us and i i, I can't remember who else was with us it was definitely me and ralph i think his brother was with us I can't remember if mike was with us as well but um i remember we listened to this album on the drive out and um and we listened to a pleasant shade of gray on the drive back as a matter of fact um but i just remember this song coming on and ralph's mom being like ralph what is this what is this crap uh <laughs> and uh, i get it, it, it I, yeah I, it, it's kind of a it's it's you use the word abrasive before to describe dr butcher this is probably the most abrasive song uh, on the album i mean it, it's, it's john oliva at his very best just you know doing both the those soaring high vocals but also like those deep growly like you know de- like just john oliva as the devil and, and you could see why they used him as uh mephistopheles to play mephistopheles on the beethoven's last night album I mean, what better what better guy to do it but um yeah the, uh just um the, it, it's it's interesting because I feel like um, there's a lot of different types of songs on this album. Uh, this song is not a representation of what is to come, uh, which is kind of cool about this album is that the songs really kind of all have their own flavor. Um, but this one definitely is, is like a real, just a real almost heavy metal kind of anthem. Um, I remember there's a, I believe there's a live version of this on one of the live albums they did. Um, it was like a Chris, Chris Oliva tribute. And it was all these live tracks from during the, all the tours from uh, the eighties. And um, I thought the live version of this was super cool, but yeah, this is a real banger to kick things off. Um, I don't, it, it's not one of my favorite songs on the album. I'll be honest. Um I don't love it as because, much as I used to. I, I think yeah, I used to it, like it's a, more it's a, as a kid. It's, it's definitely a solid tune um, and, and, a, and a, a wicked track to open things up. But um, there's definitely better things to come, at least for my taste. Yeah, I, I, it definitely is a great opener. But I think the verses are just – the verses are great. The chorus is a little meh. And so I think that because the chorus doesn't have the hooks that some of the other songs do – it pales in comparison. I mean, like you get, you go from a raging war, which is this banger of a tune into one of their most iconic, if not 
arguably their most iconic song in Gutter Ballet. Uh, one could argue that if you just take their discography as a whole, Gutter Ballet is probably the best song that they had penned up to this point in their career. Up, you know, not including some of the stuff that might come after it on this album. But if you just play every song in order, this might be the best song that they had done to this point. Um, and the keys, uh, you know, had to be a bit jarring for fans of the band because they probably were not used to to this kind of music coming from come from Sabotage. And it begs the question: Why can't John Oliva play this song live? Like, I mean, he does, but he fucks it up every single time, and I'm not sure it's like an ongoing joke. Um, I'll ask you this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll save it for the end. Um, obviously, an amazing keyboard intro. I think what, uh, Doc Wackholz's drumming on this is just superb, really heavy, and and just one of the some catchy, infectiously catchy verses with a powerful chorus. Like this is this is sabotage at its finest. And and I guess I'll ask you: Is this the first TSO song? Like truly, the first TSO song? It, it, it might be. Um, there's a few more on this album too that I think really fit that mold. But yeah, if we're going chronologically, then yeah, it might be. If if not, uh, if not, Prelude to Madness from Hall of the Mountain King. This uh, this is the first TSO song with lyrics. Uh, I, I would I would argue it's one of the finest songs the band ever recorded, not just up until this point, but ever. Um, oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's uh, it's still it's just. One of those songs where I never, ever, ever get tired of hearing it. And when I hear it, it makes me really happy. And when they played, when John Oliva, John Oliva's Pain played this, uh, when they headlined Prague Power, they had played all of Streets, but there was also some songs they played before and after. I think, God, I want to say Gutter Ballet might have been actually before. I, you could not have taken the smile off my face. It made me so happy. I, I think this is one of the the greatest metal songs ever written. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. It's my song of the week. And uh, as much as I could have like chosen something else just to be different, I I feel like it would be cheating on this song that I've loved so much for so long. I get Uh, it. So so, uh, I I just, uh, no surprise here if you knew me, but yeah, this is uh, definitely my song of the week and it's arguably my favorite sabotage song ever um so let's give a let's give it a short listen and uh we'll come back and uh i'm looking forward to finding out what your song of the week is Certainly very well said, um, an all-time classic, not just by Sabotage, but by any other band. I put it up there against just about everything. I'm happy you chose it. I think it was definitely the easy way out, but I do think that it you can't argue with it. It's just a perfect choice, um, although obviously I did go with something else. Talk to me about Temptation Revelation, because it's one of a couple of instrumentals on this album, which is also a, another uh, kind of unique trait about this album. What are your thoughts on this uh, this little gem? I, I feel like the the whole first four tracks on this album, it's so odd to me that they would, I don't know. It, the album almost feels like it's just ordered weirdly, even though like it's so ingrained in, in our heads as to what order these songs are supposed to be in. Like, I mean, shouldn't this and when the crowds are gone, like be the last two tracks on the album and shouldn't got our ballet be like the first track on the album. And like, it's just odd. It, it, it feels, I mean, I love this whole album, but like, it feels like the beginning of the album is almost a little bit front loaded when you have 
the probably the two most well-known songs from the album are in the first four tracks and one of them of those four tracks is this instrumental temptation revelation i love this it's a very uh emotional electric guitar solo it really is just a chris oliva um you know uh what's the word i'm looking for like master class yeah pretty much um you know i wanted to say about gutter ballet is that it i it was awesome to hear that like you know, Chris Oliva was like this metal guitarist that you you know these amazing riffs and this amazing technique and and um, really unique sound. And it was like Gutter Ballet was like that first song where they kind of went in a in a symphonic or or theatrical kind of direction. And his guitar fit that perfectly with the pianos and everything. It really worked. Um, so like this is, I think, some more of that because this ha- this has a very um, like a classical music kind of uh bass to it like and then he just lays these amazing guitar riffs over it 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 it's, feels very much like a um a prelude to when the crowds are gone but um i i feel like i would especially considering that spoiler alert thorazine shuffle is probably my least favorite song on the album and it's the last song I would probably move this and when the crowds are gone to the end of the disc and, uh, you know, leave mentally yours, summer's rain and Thorazine shuffle, which are, are really kind of a trilogy of songs, leave those together. But I don't know. I feel like the album would end a little stronger that way. And I might start the album with gutter ballet. I just feel like it's such a epic song. It either needs to, start the album or end the album and since i've already given the end to when the crowds are gone uh i just i don't know it's it's a weirdly ordered album and and uh you know as you'd mentioned like the those two tracks were the ones that were chosen to be the video the music videos and the singles and what have you and um so yeah uh i think it's an amazing instrumental track though it's it's you know fairly short and there'll be another one although i'll be in a totally different style um but really epic, and I feel like it just it means it leads into when the crowds are gone in such a, a great way. It's almost as if I don't know if I would want to hear when the crowds are gone just started cold without that epic way to kind of lead into it. There's a lot to unpack there. So let me start by saying Thorazine Shuffle, B-side uh, for the original pressing. So maybe that's part of the reason it just kind of there at the end uh, because it really wasn't there on the original pressing. Although that being said, I agree with you lumping temptation revelation and when the crowds are gone, absolutely necessary and easily could have ended the disc and probably would have finished it stronger. But then if you bury these two tracks, they may get lost a little bit to, to people with short attention spans. Temptation revelation is just a beautiful, beautiful tune. And I really do love the marriage between the guitar and the keyboards it's almost like Chris Oliva is singing to you, but he's using his guitar to do it, which is a really um, an approach that I've always loved. And then all of a sudden, at about a minute and a half into this short song, it just gets really dark and symphonic, and almost like almost like um, almost like a movie score feel to it, which is kind of cool. And then it's like, and, and you took the word right out of my mouth when you said a prelude, because that's what it is in many ways, a prelude to when the crowds are gone. And that is the first true ballad on this disc. And it's a really emotional one at that. It is, it starts as every ballad should, in my opinion, John Oliva and a piano. That's all you need. Right. And like, and then all of a sudden the band joins in for what is, can only be described as like the perfect chorus that immediately gets stuck in your head. And I just remember thinking to myself, like nothing sounded like this in 1989. And I mean, nothing. Um, And as if that wasn't perfect, there's this extended bridge, which Sabotage has been known to do throughout the years, but you really kind of hear it here for the first time. Magical, magical lyrics. And even the piano outro is just something to behold. I, worry how you're going to edit this but this is my song of the week and i'm not sure you can limit it to one minute so i wish you nothing but the best of luck but let's give it a listen now and then we'll uh come back and hear your thoughts I'm not 
So I've obviously gushed about this one. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Talk to me about uh, when the crowds are gone and your your thoughts on this this ballad. I uh, I I feel like a lot of people consider believe to be the the ultimate sabotage, you know, power ballad, but all those people are wrong. It's <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> um, believe does actually use, I think, a um, at least a, a, a portion of, of, of melody from this song. And then it would be used again in um, uh, Alone You Breathe, which was the last track on Handful of Rain. It's almost like the, the, the uh, When the Crowds Are Gone reprise. Um, just, uh, you know, it, it's been said that, you know, Glenn Harveston wanted, wants this to be the last song ever played at Prague Power. Um, it, it, if nothing else, it, it's, it might go down as the last song John Oliva sang. will sing at Prague Power, depending on how things shake out the future. Because, uh, when he played the, his Streets album or the John Oliva's Pain did the Streets album, um, they ended the show with Temptation Revelation and When the Crowds Are Gone. Not, not to, not to be, uh, left out. Uh, Hall of the Mountain King preceded that, um, with, uh, the uh, John, the lead singer from Need, coming out on on stage and uh, joining um, the fray, which was cool. And then before Streets, I had mentioned uh, Gutter Ballet. They also played uh, Of Rage and War and Mentally Yours. So a lot of Gutter Ballet was represented that night, in spite of it being, you know, Streets night. Um, but yeah, I absolutely adore the song. Um, it's such an emotional song. John just sings the hell out of it uh the guitar is amazing the whole thing the piano it's just a perfect ballad and it really should have been the last song on the album even if you're not counting thorazine shuffle and i love summer's rain and summer's rain is a beautiful ballad in its own right this this should have been the last song on the album i may have to drop a uh, a reorder a gutter ballet reorder we've done this in the past with other albums but i just feel like this album is so oddly ordered in in retrospect i it, i'm sure there was a, a a mentality that went into how this was ordered at the time but um and again we're talking about a time where you know you had cassettes and vinyl records where you were flipping and there was probably a pause somewhere in the middle um but yeah i have thoughts um and so, yeah, I, uh, but I do absolutely love the song and, and it's just one of my all time favorite power ballads and one of my favorite songs. And, and, you know, right off the bat, you know, we're four tracks in and it's like two of my all time favorite songs. It's kind of hard to follow that. And that's a, a, again, why I think the order is a little bit lopsided. Um, but I'll, cont- I'll carry on that kind of theme as we, as we proceed. Well, well said. We get to Silk and Steel, which may sound crazy. I think it's arguably one of Chris Oliva's finest moments as a guitar player. This acoustic guitar rendition um, is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that you will ever hear. Um, This also, in many ways, could have ended the entire album. And I know I understand why you would say When the Crowds Are Gone is obviously the closer. I think a case could be made for this as well. And it's interesting because TSO has often played this, and I don't know if they still do it. It's been a while for me. You would certainly know. But they play it as kind of music over the PA system before the TSO show starts. And I can't think of a better song than this to kind of get people ready for what, what what's about to come with TSO. I, I love this song. I think it is just a beautiful piece of music. I remember marking out, walking into TSO and hearing this being played and being like, do you know what this is? And like, everyone's like, who cares? Like, who, like what are you babbling about? You want <laughs> tech? Um, I love that. I thought that was such a nice touch. Um, I, the last time I saw them, which was last year, they were still playing this as you walked in. That's it, awesome. I, it wouldn't be, I, I've seen TSO, I think 13 times now. Um, and I don't think it wouldn't be a TSO show if I didn't hear this song uh, walking into the arena, uh, waiting for the band to start playing. Um, it's it, there's a bunch of other like really mellow piano or, or acoustic guitar songs that they use, but I think this is the only sabotage song. 
you know, that's labeled as a sabotage song that they use. And uh, it felt like an Easter egg for like a, a for the diehard sabotage fans. And I have a feeling that Paul O'Neill did that on purpose, but it, and it also, and also was a way to kind of have Chris Oliva involved, even though he was unfortunately um, gone by the time TSO, you know, became a thing. But yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's how I, oh, I always think of that as well. It's a really great um, acoustic guitar solo. Um, and I agree, would have made for a great way to end the album. You could even end the album with uh, Temptation Revelation, When the Crowds Are Gone, and then finish it off with Silk and Steel. And I think I like that it. would still, I think that would still end it in, in a really uh, strong way. Um, but uh yeah, good, good, really cool stuff. I, I like this was it was one of my earlier metal albums, as I mentioned, but um, it was probably the first album I had that would have like an extend like extended guitar solos on it, and so that was really um, important, I think, uh, at the time. Like as a, as somebody who was slowly becoming a big metal fan, um, you know, hearing just what a guitar can do on its own, uh, and Chris Oliva. Hell of a hell of a teacher for for that. So, I, yeah, uh, like I said, I used the word earlier, but it, it certainly applies. Masterclass. I, I obviously we've been gushing over the album, but that is not to say that it is a perfect album by any means. There are songs on the back half of this album that I think are good songs, but I don't think they're great. And I I would put "She's in Love" in that category. It is another banger of a tune. If there's a, if it's a record, this is obviously, I think, the start of side B. Uh, Chris Oliva plugs the guitar back in. Awesome riff to start with these really nice bass lines underneath that, um, you know, I, I think we, we'd be remiss not to kind of mention that Johnny Lee Middleton, kind of an unheralded hero with this band. He, his bass lines are fantastic. Um, but that being said, even though the album kind of needed a little bit more of that upbeat, pick me up at this point it's a good metal song it's just not my favorite song as compared to other things on the album yeah i I kind of agree with you i feel like um we haven't quite got to the point where sabotage was making an album where every song was like great to excellent to iconic and again you know we're talking this is very uh subjective stuff here but um i this is of these uh, last handful of songs, um, this one's kind of in the middle for me. Um, the lyrics are kind of funny. I, I don't know if you ever actually like sat down and read them, but I'm pretty sure this is a song about a blowjob. Like it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's that's the way I thought of it in high school, and I still and I still do. Um, I really think that's just what this song is about. Um, and uh, I did say just, it was a banger. I did. I actually led with that. I want to be clear. Yeah, it was a, it's a mouth banger. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, but uh, it's it's definitely a rocking song, man. Like the like Chris Oliva is kind of the star here. Um, it, it's a catchy riff. It's just a, it's like a slightly above average song, in my opinion. Like it's not as good as Hounds, which follows it, but. I want to hear your thoughts first. Talk to me about Hounds. Yeah, so this is, I think, another kind of um, prelude to TSO in a lot of ways because it it has more of a um, like a theatrical, dramatic kind of feel to it. You know, it, it starts out like really um, mellow with um, the, you know these little like almost these plucks, these acoustic guitar pluckings, and then it kicks in like less than a minute into it. it like the electric guitars come in and it's it, there's a um really prominent organ sound going on i mean this is a real um impressive tune and i think that it was you'll i don't know if you'll agree it, it, for me it was a song i probably didn't appreciate as much as i should when i was younger because of some of the a, a lot of it was just because like like i mentioned like those first five tracks were so huge and so iconic. It was almost like you hit like f- fatigue <laughs> halfway through the album because like the beginning of it is is so strong. But this is a really um a really good of uh, just a really good track and kind of shows and I, I 
would be willing to bet I'd said something to this effect on previous Sabotage episodes, but their mid, mid-tempo mid songs are probably among the best of any metal band. The way that they can make a mid-tempo song just as interesting as like a fast song or a ballad. And this is kind of, I think, one of those tracks that um, feels that way. Um, it, it has a very like deliberate gate to it um but it's a really it's like a really epic song i i really like that they went with the um just that kind of or that organ it's almost like a church organ sound in the background and then at the end of the track it's about i don't know a minute and a half left and and it goes into like that chris oliva wild man guitar solo (laughs) that is very similar to it reminds me a lot of the guitar solo from she carves the stone from edge of thorns um which you know go back to the archives and we talked at length about that but um and then he does um that you know the the uh the the eddie van halen style i don't know what you what you call that super fast tapping or whatever um it's definitely a, a another you know it's another chris oliva uh I was gonna. I was gonna say the word fiasco. That's not the word I was looking for. Uh, you know, tour de force. I guess would be a better term. But um, yeah, this is a really good tune. Um, I, I think it was uh, something I sh- should have appreciated more. But um, you know, time, time, uh, time changes things, and this is it has become one of my favorite songs on the album, actually. I've done a 180 on this one as well. I don't know that I ever appreciated it as much as I have maybe the last decade, maybe the last dozen years or so. Very dark, very heavy. And I love the what you said about like the guitar solo towards the end. This thing almost goes off the rails. I mean, this is wild and all over the place. And somehow they just kind of bring you back into that. And, and, you know, for the final chorus, this is a great tune. Um, it's, it's, a great live tune as well. I've heard live renditions of this. It's really, really good. Oh, I would love to hear it. I don't think I've ever seen them perform it live, but uh, like I've only seen the band once and John Oliva's pain once. Um, But yeah, I don't think I've ever seen any, I don't, I've never seen anyone perform this song live, not even just, you know, like, local jobbers um. <laughs> uh, one of the things i just be remiss not to mention john's vocals on this it's like the best of both worlds you get like angry john and, and clean john on the same track which is always fun great tune um and i would argue that the final solo on this is one of the best on the entire album it might actually be my favorite um but I, you know it's funny we're getting towards the end of this album and i i do think that this was like one of the last really true high spots we may differ a little bit on Summer's Rain. I like that tune, but I just don't think it – I think it pales in comparison to some of the uh, other ballads. But let, let's get through Unholy, the Unholy first. This was the one song that I kind of went back to and forgot about at least a little bit. Um, but then as soon as I heard the verses, I'm like, oh, I, I remember this you know better than I thought. It's a good tune, very proggy, kind of all over the place for sabotage at this point. But for me, I think the best part of the song were the verses because I thought they were really catchy. And and the pre-chorus actually reminded me of some power metal, like some of just American power metal, which sabotage really didn't do much of. But here I thought it, it kind of resonated with me. It's a good song, but I, I think Hounds, for my money, was a, was a better track. Uh, I probably like this song a little bit more than you do. I don't think that the... Um... I don't think the chorus is great. Um, I love the the guitar that kicks in the song is I love that that solo at the beginning of the song is so I love that. It's one of my favorite Chris Oliva uh, guitar intros to a song, and the verses are really killer. And then the chorus is just kind of okay. Like it, it doesn't hold up the end of the, its end of the bargain compared right. to the rest of the song. Um, the riff kind of makes a comeback later on that opening riff comes back. And, and, and I think that like makes the song feel interesting again, but if it, it falls a little flat and I, I think it's really just the chorus for me that, that causes it. Um, yeah, I, 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 would I think it that. is a shade below hounds though. Uh, yeah. All, all I agree with all of that. Um, and then we get to mentally yours. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I don't like this track very much. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that 
when you start with John and a keyboard, um, it's kind of reminiscent of what you'd hear on streets. The band kicks in and it's got this really different feel when you get into the proper track. The verses are fine, but the chorus is fucking terrible. And I really, <laughs> I, I think that that's my biggest problem with this thing. It actually detracts from my enjoyment. So on what's otherwise a very good album, this is a miss for me. I, I think the instrumental section is cool. It picks up quite a bit and has that like the patented metal exchange gallop is, is there in full force and effect, but it's too short. And then you get back into the chorus and, and, uh, and you've lost me at that point. You like it more than I do? Uh, maybe a little after that, uh, after that disappointing review. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always thought it was kind of funny that it starts out like this, like what feels like this kind of emotional piano beginning. Uh, and then like just, just changes into like this kind of darker um heavy metal song um i never knew that this and this and the next two tracks were part of a uh a, a, a conceptual suite um so maybe it makes more sense um putting it all together i i'd, I'd like to know more about that as i don't know uh I don't really know very well what that story is that they're trying to tell. Um, this is obviously a song about um, mental health, if nothing else. Um, but it's uh, other than Thorazine Shuffle, it's probably my least favorite song on the album. Although um, for me, like the worst song on on this album is middle of the road at at, at worst um and yeah listen kind of bad a, sabotage is still good music it's just yeah not, better than just, a lot of bands best so so with that said you had alluded to summer's rain earlier what are your thoughts on this track kind of buried towards the end i think this is one of the most underrated sabotage songs of all time nobody ever talks about it and i think it's just a really beautiful ballad the way that it goes like it kind of goes back and forth from being like really soft and, and mellow to like heavy and, and, and sabotage would do lots of songs like this uh, going forward. But this is really nice uh, in the fact that like it's, it's a power ballad, but I feel like it's done in a very different way than when the crowds are gone so that it actually has its own identity to it. And it doesn't feel like they're just churning out another version of when the crowds are gone. I still think when the crowds are gone is a slightly better song overall, but this is a really strong song. And, and I I've talked about it in the past, how I think sabotage were the masters of the power ballad. Nobody in my opinion does it better. And they've, there's two of the best right on this album. Summer's rain is one of them. And, and the guitar work is phenomenal. Uh, the, the solos towards the end and, and then it just uh, it gets quiet again, and then it ends with a, like a big bombastic, you know, the the brothers just Chris Chris shredding and John screaming. Like, <laughs> it, there's no better combo. Like, it's 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 I I think that had you know had we not if we're not going to change the the entire order of the album, I, I really kind of wish this was the last track on the album. I, I understand that it was not. Um, that Thorazine Shuffle is not on the vinyl, uh, but it was on the cassette and the CD releases. To me, I always had the CD release with this uh, with that track on it. I never really, because it said bonus track on the disc, I never really considered it like part of Gutter Ballet. Um, but now reading that it's like part of this trilogy, now I'm kind of thinking that it is, and that makes me sad because it shouldn't. Like, I, I just don't. Is there to be a standalone? Yeah, it's just not, it's like my least favorite song on the album. It's honestly one of my least favorite Sabotage songs. I just think it's um, kind of blah. Like it, so it's, um, I, I want to jump in for a second. With with regard to Summer's Rain, I, I think it's it could have easily been on streets. It it's almost has a story-like quality to it, but it's also very uplifting. And I think that that's part of the allure for me. Um, really good tune. I, I, I agree with you. As far as Thorazine Shuffle goes... I thought it sounded to me like a very slowed down version of 24 Hours Ago, which it's funny because I love 24 Hours Ago, but I can't really stand this track so much. Um, I, it's not memorable. It's not great. But I'll tell you this, which is kind of nuts. I would love to hear this live. 
if for no other reason than it's just a real deep cut, nobody ever talks about it, kind of a B-side, I'd love to hear it live. I wonder if it would do it justice or, or whatnot. But that being said, good at the back, back, back of this disc, not my, my favorite. And it's funny because this album has some of the highest of the highs and as far as Sabotage goes, some of the lowest of the lows. Not that it's bad. It's just not up to snuff compared with other stuff. So it's a really unbalanced album in many ways. Yeah, this I agree. This song really belonged on uh, Hall of the Mountain King. Yeah. Um, it, uh, there's parts of it that remind me of Beyond the Doors of the Dark as well, um, but um, definitely agree with the 24 Hours Ago uh, comparison as well, but the, the chorus is is so blah. Um, so yeah, not my favorite. It, it was Going back and listening to this album was it, the slightly disappointing, only because some of the weaker songs I feel like dragged down the, the album's score. Like, yeah. if you had asked me years ago, I, I feel like I would say that there's no way I would rank this album below a nine, but I, I but think I'm gonna. It doesn't deserve it, it can't be a nine because there's, and, and I'm just being objective. The, when you put nostalgia aside, some of this stuff is just not the best sabotage material. It can't be a nine or a 9.5 because there's albums that they've come out with that from top to bottom are better, even though the high points on this are arguably as high as it gets. Arguably. Yeah, I'm kind of with you there. And and I, I, I'm going to do a quick search because I, I really am curious what we gave our – Previous, what we gave our previous uh, sabotage albums. So, uh, just as a recap, uh, we both gave Dead Winter Dead a nine point five. Uh, Edge of Thorns, I gave eight point seven five. You gave eight point five. Um, Streets, I gave nine point seven five. You gave nine point five. And so now that leaves us at uh, at Gutter Ballet, and. I, I don't know. To me, it's definitely not as high for me as Dead Winter Dead or Streets. That's for very sure. Um, it might be a little bit more on par with Edge of Thorns. Although, I don't know. I feel like if, if I had to choose which one to listen to, it's hard. I feel like the highs are higher on Goddard Ballet, but I feel like Edge of Thorns is is a more consistent album so i think i'm gonna give it the same score i gave edge of thorns and give it an 8.75 i think that's where i'm at on this i think it's about the same as edge of thorns as well because edge of thorns has a couple of tracks that i don't think are perfect but then there's other things that are just all-time highlights it's a it's a notch below though i i i'm at an 8.25 on this it's probably my least favorite of the four we've done to date but certainly a very, very good album. I mean, that's a very high score. It's just there's some dead weight on here, and I, I don't, I can't, I can't give a super high score to an album where there's songs that are merely good or passable. Yeah, uh, and I think that's fair. And um, I, I don't know. It was almost like I almost felt sad <laughs> when I listened <laughs> to. It. I was like, oh, I kind of forgot that like not everything is gutter ballet and when the crowds are gone you know level greatness and you know we still have yet we still have to talk about um hall of the mountain king handful of rain and and wake of magellan in particular i think those are three of of the band's uh you know heavy hitter albums that we've yet to talk about um wake of magellan may be my favorite and we'll find out when we get to it um but you know that as much as I enjoyed the John era uh, in the early days, the John and Chris era of sabotage, like those Dead Winter Dead and Wake Him and John, when they have that full lineup of of Petrelli and Caffrey and Plate and Middleton and yeah. Zach and John on vocals, that to me is like the ultimate sabotage lineup. And maybe it's just because it's basically TSO as a metal band. Uh, or maybe TSO is sabotage as a Christmas, uh, you know, <laughs> rock band. But um, I love just those albums. The songs are just so well written, and and the production's incredible. And um, it's just those two albums are so are almost untouchable for me. So it, it, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about that, and I'm glad that sabotage has 
more stuff for us to delve into. And, and the, the, we keep it to one a year so that we can kind of keep the sabotage train rolling for a while. Um, but I, I, this is, these episodes are, are, I look forward to all year to, to talking about this band because they were like my first love in metal. And, and I still consider them like one of my all time favorite bands. It's just crazy to think that like we've gone, you know, 20 plus years now without anything new from them. Like all this time we've been getting, you know, new Halloween stuff and, and, uh, you know, other bands, um, that just have been churning out stuff and to think about like, what would have been like 23 years of sabotage releases. I mean, I guess we do have, you know, John Oliva's pain albums and circle of circle albums, but to me, it just, you know, it's not the same. So yeah. Uh, it's always a, a, a joy talking about this band and it's, it's really interesting after all these years to, to start like ranking these albums that were like a really important uh, part of my, you know, upbringing in, in metal. So, um, but I think both of our scores are pretty fair in this case. My score is probably weighted a little bit uh, higher based on my love of the band and how much I adore the songs on this album that I really like, which which are, you know, Summer's Rain and uh, When the Crowds Are Gone and Gutter Ballet and the two, uh, and the two instrumental tracks. Um, and, and even, like, the songs that I don't like as much are still pretty good tunes so are you trying to convince yourself if, as to why you gave it the score you did because no i'm just defending like myself in case yeah. anybody disagrees i'll probably get i'll probably I, i'm expecting to get shit for ranking it too low honestly so it's uh, i'm curious to see uh you know what gets said so i'm just trying to solidify my opinion uh in case anybody asks uh, i don't have to repeat it but uh Very that's, well. that's 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 how i feel about it well, always fun doing Sabotage. I look forward to next year and uh, kind of a hard to keep picking albums just because I don't know which. I mean, I, I think there's something to be said for discussing all of them. And needless to say, here's a little spoiler. If they ever come out with a new album, we'll definitely be covering that in long form. And we may have to advance it because I'll be listening to that nonstop. For oh, well, we did it for Halloween and we'll do it for Sabotage. There you go. Um so that brings us to next week, and it is the start you mean of a new year. Next year, <laughs> yeah, next week, next year. It's the start of a new year, and it's the first Monday of the month. So we are going to do an album by request, as we always do for our Patreon members, the first Monday of a month. We're going to cover a band that we are long overdue in covering. We are nearly two hundred episodes now, and we have not touched this band, which it's criminal uh, in many ways. The band. You you might say we were uh, breaking the law. You you could say that. You could say that. The band, after that intro, obviously <laughs> Judas Priest, but the album is Turbo. It came out in March of 1986, and it is a very different Judas Priest album, and I think it's going to make for a very interesting conversation. It's our first request made for by a bird. Yeah. Uh, the, me- the metal pigeon, Sean, uh, our friend from... The uh, MSR cast uh, requested this, and uh, to be honest with you, like I don't know that I've ever sat down and listened to a Judas Priest album start to finish. So I'm excited to to, to delve into this. I, I was always an iron, more of an Iron Maiden guy, and and, and not because I dislike Judas Priest. I just it was just one of those things where it was like you look and you look you look and see that discography, and you, and you just throw your hands up in the air and be like oh, like I just am not going to be able to figure out where to even start so uh, we'll let somebody else decide where I'm going to start in this case well I, I will just say one other thing before we go just from a review uh, that I read online this is their worst yet most interesting album not my words somebody else's I'll let you draw your own conclusions uh, I mean, you know, uh, sometimes bands' worst albums are their most interesting albums. I, I, I'm looking at you falling into infinity. Um, it, it's and they certainly make for the most interesting discussion. So uh, I'm excited. I, I, maybe this is not the right album for me to start my Judas Priest voyage on, but uh, I think you're gonna like it. 
That's the thing because you have no basis for comparison. So I actually think you're going to like it. But to be continued after the new year and shortly thereafter, we will be giving our top 50 uh, episode, which we look forward to all year long. So thanks again for everyone's support. Give us a like and a follow if you like what you hear. Certainly consider joining our Patreon. The information for that can be found uh, below. And join the chat. Come over to Metal Exchanges, the official Facebook group of the Metal Exchange podcast. We would love to hear your thoughts on this episode and uh, everything else going on in the world of metal. So happy new year. Merry Christmas. And I will uh, talk to you on the flip side. Yeah. Uh, to all of our uh, new listeners, we the, the the Nevermore week really brought a lot of new uh a lot of new ears to the metal exchange. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, if you're listening to this, clearly you, you did stick with us and we appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been a, a, a hell of a year. Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the year in review in a couple of weeks. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I think, uh, for us as, uh, as a podcast, um, we a lot of did a lot of cool stuff this year. In the end, I think we I think we ended really strong. So um, stay tuned, plenty more to come. Uh, to quote uh, our friend Adam, who was uh, part of our Patreon, um, you know, he said the the great thing about this podcast is that you know that there's just so much more stuff yet to be covered. So uh, and that's so true. Um, this is a podcast that literally could continue until one of us croaks and hopefully and if it that does we'll just pull soon. a kiss and we'll do the whole like you know 3d like you know thing that they're about to do so because the, the brand will never die and neither will the metal exchange <laughs> yep welcome back to the hologram <laughs> enjoy the week my friend i'll talk to you soon merry christmas <laughs>